Welcome to chapter 20 and Things Fall Apart. Uh, you remember that at the end of part 2, the conqueror throws a feast because his time in exile is up, and now he's going back to Umuafia. So here we go with chapter 20. Seven years was a long time to be away from one's clan. A man's place was not always there waiting for him. As soon as he left, someone else rose and filled it. The clan was like a lizard. If it lost its tail, it soon grew another. Akonkwo knew these things. He knew that he had lost his place among the nine masked spirits who administered justice in the clan. He had lost the chance to lead his warlike clan against the new religion, which he was told had gained ground. He had lost the years in which he might have taken the highest titles in the clan. But some of those losses were not irreparable. He was determined that his return should be marked by his people. He would return with a flourish and regain the seven wasted years. So you can see that Akankwa is excited to come back to Umuafia, and he thinks that he's going to be able to kind of make up some of the lost ground, having been away for seven years. Even in his first year in exile, he had begun to plan for his return. The first thing he would do would be to rebuild his compound on a more magnificent scale. He would build a bigger barn than he had had before, and he would build huts for two new wives. Then he would show his wealth by initiating his sons into the Ozo Society. Only the really great men in the clan were able to do this. Okonkwo saw clearly the high esteem in which he would be held, and he saw himself taking the highest title in the land. As the years of exile passed, one by one it seemed to him that his chi might now be making amends for the past disaster. His yams grew abundantly, not only in his motherland, but also in Umuafia, where his friend gave them out year by year to sharecroppers. Then the tragedy of his first son had occurred. At first it appeared as if it might prove too great for his spirit, but it was a resilient spirit, and in the end Akankwa overcame his sorrow. He had five other sons, and he would bring them up in the way of the clan. He sent for the five sons, and they came and sat in his obi. The youngest of them was four years old. You have all seen the great abomination of your brother. Now he is no longer my son or your brother. I will only have a son who is a man, who will hold his head up among my people. If any one of you prefers to be a woman, let him follow Nwoye now while I am alive, so that I can curse him. If you turn against me when I am dead, I will visit you and break your neck. Okonkwo was very lucky in his daughters. He never stopped regretting that Azinma was a girl. Of all his children, she alone understood his every mood. A bond of sympathy had grown between them as the, as the years had passed. Azinma grew up in her father's exile and became one of the most beautiful girls in Mbanta. She was called Crystal of Beauty, as her mother had been called in her youth. The young, ailing girl who had caused her mother so much heartache had been transformed almost overnight into a healthy, buoyant maiden. She had, it was true, her moments of depression when she would snap at everybody like an angry dog. These moods descended on her suddenly and for no apparent reason, but they were very rare and short-lived. As long as they lasted, she could bear no other person but her father. Many young men and prosperous middle-aged men of Mbanta came to marry her, but she refused them all, because her father had called her one evening and said to her, There are many good and prosperous people here, but I shall be happy if you marry an Umuafia when we return home. That was all he had said, but Azinma had seen clearly all the thought and hidden meaning behind the few words, and she had agreed. Your half-sister Obia Jelly will not understand me, Okonkwo said, but you can explain to her. Although they were almost the same age, Azinma wielded a strong influence over her half-sister. She explained to her why they should not marry yet, and she, and she agreed also. And so the two of them refused every offer of marriage in Mbanta. So you can kind of start to see Akankwa's plan. If he can marry Azinma off to another family um, and kind of get back into the clan that way, then it'll be helpful for him. And so he doesn't want his daughters to marry in Mbanta, but in Umuafia, so that he can start to reinitiate his old life, basically. I wish she were a boy, Akankwa thought within himself. She understood things so perfectly. Who else among his children could have read his thoughts so well? With two beautiful grown-up daughters, his return to Umuafia would attract considerable attention. His future sons-in-law would be men of authority in the clan. The poor and unknown would not dare to come forth. 
Umuafia had indeed changed during the seven years Akanku had been in exile. The church had come and led many astray. Not only the lowborn and the outcast, but sometimes a worthy man had joined it. Such a man was Aguefe Ugona, who had taken two titles, and who, like a madman, had cut the anklet of his titles and cast it away to join the Christians. The white missionary was very proud of him, and he was one of the first men in Umuafia to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, or Holy Feast as it was called in Igbo. Agwefe Ugona had thought of the feast in terms of eating and drinking, only more holy than the village variety. He had therefore put his drinking horn into his goatskin bag for the occasion. And that part's included to show you that even though the Igbo are converting to Christianity, they still don't fully grasp, you know, all of the the nuances and, and kind of subtleties of the Christian faith. But apart from the church, the white men had also brought a government. They had built a court where the district commissioner judged cases in ignorance. He had court messengers who brought men to him for trial. Many of these messengers came from Umuru on the bank of the great river, where the white men first came many years before, and where they had built the center of their religion and trade and government. These court messengers were greatly hated in Umuafia because they were foreigners and also arrogant and high-handed. They were called Katma, and because of their ash-colored shorts, they earned the additional name of Ashy Buttocks. They guarded the prison, which was full of men who had offended against the white man's law. Some of these prisoners had thrown away their twins, and some had molested the Christians. And when it says molested here, it doesn't mean that they tried to touch them inappropriately or something like that. It just means that they harassed or bothered these people. They were beaten in the prison by the Katma and made to work every morning clearing the government compound and fetching wood for the white commissioner and the court messengers. Some of these prisoners were men of title who should be above such mean occupation. They were grieved by the indignity and mourned for the neglected farms. As they cut grass in the morning, the younger men sang in time with the strokes of their machetes. Kopma of the Ashbatoks, he is fit to be a slave. The white man has no sense, he is fit to be a slave. The court messengers did not like to be called Ashy Buttocks, and they beat the men, but the song spread in Umuafia. So Achebe is putting this piece in here to show you that not only do they have a religion which allowed them to kind of come in and infiltrate peacefully um, into the Igbo society, but now they have a government and they're starting to put their own laws and rules into effect. And really they're ignoring um, the Igbo customs. So it, this is hegemony where one culture is starting to influence another. And that they brought their government in is also imperialism and that they're settling there is colonialism. So there's a lot going on here. Akankwo's head was bowed in sadness as Obierka told him these things. Perhaps I have been away too long, Akankwo said almost to himself, but I cannot understand these things you tell me. What is it that happened to our people? Why have they lost the power to fight? Have you not heard how the white man wiped out Abame? asked Obierka. I have heard, said Akankwo, but I have also heard that Abame people were weak and foolish. Why did they not fight back? Had they no guns and machetes? We would be cowards to compare ourselves with the men of Ababe. Their fathers had never dared to stand before our ancestors. We must fight these men and drive them from the land. It is already too late, said Obierka sadly. Our own men and sons have joined the ranks of the stranger. They have joined his religion and they help to uphold his government. If we should try to drive out the white men in Umuafia, we should find it easy. There are only two of them. But what of our own people who are following their way and have been given power? They would go to Umuru and bring the soldiers, and we would be like Abame. He paused for a long time and then said, I told you on my last visit to Mbanta how they hanged Eneto. What has happened to that piece of land in dispute? asked Akankwo. The white man's court has decided that it should belong to Inama's family, who had given much money to the white man's messengers and interpreter. Does the white man understand our custom about land? How can he when he does not even speak our tongue? But he says that our customs are bad, and our own brothers 
who have taken up his religion also say that our customs are bad. How do you think we can fight when our own brothers have turned against us? The white man is very clever. He came quietly and peaceably with his religion. We were amused at his foolishness and allowed him to stay. Now he has won our brothers and our clan can no longer act like one. He has put a knife on the things that held us together and we have fallen apart. That's actually one of the most important passages in the entire novel here. Uh, Obi Erica puts it right out there. The white men came in peaceably with their religion. They, they acted like they were friendly, like they wanted to help the Igbo people. Oh, hey, Igbo people, come join my religion. It's, it's going to help you. It's going to save your lives and your souls and all of this stuff. And then meanwhile, while these people think, oh, this is good. This is a good thing. It's all friendliness here. Everybody's invited. We're all going to get along fine in this new religion. While they were busy doing that over here, the, the white men bring their government in kind of behind them and start to establish laws and rules and other things. Not only that, but they also bring a school. And if they have a school, they can teach them what they want the Igbo to know. So all three of those things kind of come together to create this controlling power that the Europeans are, are um, enacting on the Igbo people here. And so now they can't do anything about it. You recall a few chapters back in part two, we talked about all the mistakes kind of that the Igbo people were making about allowing them to build this church and then pretending that everything was fine because the guy who killed the sacred python died. And now, um, now they can't do anything about it because members of their own clan are now within the church. So if they try to fight them, they're fighting themselves. And so they've already lost the battle before they even decided to wage one. How did they get hold of Inetro to hang him? asked the Conquo. When he killed Oduche in the fight over the land, he fled to Aninta to escape the wrath of the earth. This was about eight days after the fight, because Oduche had not died immediately from his wounds. It was on the seventh day that he died. But everybody knew he was going to die, and Aneto got his belongings together in readiness to flee. But the Christians had told the white man about the accident, and he sent his Kotma to catch Aneto. He was imprisoned with all the leaders of his family, and in the end, Oduche died and Aneto was taken to Umuru and hanged. The other people were released, but even now they have not found the mouth with which to tell of their suffering. The two men sat in silence for a long while afterwards. So not only do the white people bring their government in, but they also bring the death penalty with them. And so even though they don't understand the Igbo customs, they're holding the Igbos to their laws. And so it's not really fair to the Igbo people at all, but these European colonialists don't care. They want to control the region. And that's it for chapter 20. Next time we're going to get to chapter 21.